Welcome to the Digital Solicitor Podcast with me, Christina Grasco. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Miller, who is head of the justice team at the Law Society, to talk about legal aid. Richard is one of the most committed and genuine supporters of legal aid and has regularly put himself wholeheartedly into the fight with all sitting governments to try and improve the lot of the legal aid lawyer. So it's a pleasure to have you here today, Richard, for what I hope will be a deep dive into the most pressing legal aid issues in this most extraordinary of times. Can I start by asking you to explain a little about what you and the justice team do at the Law Society? Thank you, Christina. I lead a team of eight people at the Law Society. We cover legal aid, pro bono, the court reform programme, civil justice, support for solicitors doing advocacy work and approaches to try to improve judicial diversity and support solicitor judges. So it's a very broad team with a lot of uh, areas that we have to cover. My team are all experts in their individual fields. Some of them have actually been at the Law Society for more than the 13 years that I have been there and have been as committed to justice as I am. The work we do includes lobbying the government. We work with the parliamentary team that has expertise in how to persuade parliamentarians to take the decisions that we want them to take. We undertake strategic litigation we draft responses to consultations, and we have regular meetings with civil servants to engage with the detail of proposals coming out of government and to try to shape them in ways that will support rather than undermining justice. Now, I know that means your remit is across the justice system and not limited to legal aid. However, given the strictures we are working under at the moment, the toughest roles have undoubtedly been for anyone working on the front line in courts, police stations and detention centres under legal aid contracts. What are the biggest headaches facing them and the justice system at the moment? Right now, one of the major problems is how do you keep people safe when they have to attend court in person? And how can you ensure that as many cases as possible are dealt with remotely without also undermining justice? One of the concerns we've always had is that remote cases can lead to unfair results. There is evidence to suggest that uh, decision makers are sometimes less sympathetic to people when they see them on video rather than in person. There are concerns about, for example, whether juries would see everything that's going on in the court, would pick up on body language and other cues that you, you don't necessarily see if you're just watching a video. So there are a whole host of concerns that video attendance at hearings can have an impact on the quality of justice. And this is something that we are very concerned should be evaluated properly. But having said that, during the pandemic, very often the choice is between this sort of approach or not holding cases at all at the moment and delaying them indefinitely. And those are both less than desirable outcomes, but very often holding the remote hearing and just acknowledging its limitations is a better option than just delaying indefinitely. Has there been much resistance from all the parties, I'm thinking both from the judges involved and the parties before the judges, there's been much resistance or has there been a fairly even-handed acceptance that this is where we are and it's the best we can do? One of the challenges has been that you have a lot of different parties involved in these cases and that can sometimes lead to different viewpoints as to what should be done remotely, what should be done in person and how things should operate generally. Some people involved in the system are not comfortable using technology and have taken a while to get up the very steep learning curve to be able to use it effectively. Some people are concerned about the quality of justice and feel that hearings can't happen effectively over video links. This is particularly the case if you're dealing with vulnerable clients or in cases where there is a lot of evidence where you need cross-examination. Those sorts of cases very often do need to be undertaken face-to-face -face rather than by video links. There are also issues around, for example, the police engaging with video remand hearings. A system was set up to enable many first hearings to be conducted by video link from the police station to the court. But unfortunately, this has major resource implications for the police in terms of manpower, the direct cost, and also the usage of their cells 
for a lot longer when people are dealt with by video. So this meant that the police felt they couldn't continue universally using the uh, video remand hearings, which in turn meant you have more people having to go to court in person, which has safety implications for all those involved in the processes. So there's a lot of work at the moment to try to get to a stage where the police are more comfortable using the video remand hearings more extensively so as to keep people safe and reduce the footfall in the courts. Are some of their problems actually even surmountable if it's a question of, for example, space in the cells and how long somebody's being held there? There are some aspects that may be almost impossible to overcome. Some of it is just down to how they manage things, but that in turn means they need to have the resources to be able to plan it out and work out how to make it work effectively. So I think additional resource will go a long way to resolving the problems in many police stations. Inevitably, there will be some where there just isn't an adequate solution that can be found in the circumstances. So how are the courts handling the very practical issue of trying to put people in the court and keeping them safe? There have been a lot of issues up and down the country with courts trying to devise and effectively apply safety guidelines that ensure that uh, courts are COVID safe. Um, We get a lot of reports from our members that uh, either the guidelines are ineffective or they're not being applied effectively. One of the difficulties is you can't have one single national set of rules because courts vary so much in their structure and layout. So you get some courts which have very large, open, common areas. Those courts are much more easily able to adapt than some of the old 19th century buildings where you have narrow corridors and very close spaces and small rooms. So each court has to make its own assessment as to how it can run and be COVID safe. And I think there's often scope for disagreement as to what actually amounts to being COVID safe. There are also some real problems in terms of applying the guidelines. So we hear of security staff not distancing themselves from those they are having to search on entry into the courts. We hear of people not wearing masks. We hear of people not socially distancing within the courts. So a whole host of problems where the rules are not being applied and our members and other court users feel unsafe as a result of this. A key part of what we've been trying to do over the past year is to bring these issues to the attention of the Courts and Tribunal Service so that they can uh, investigate them and, where necessary, direct from the top what needs to be done to try to make sure that courts are safe. Constant problem, and it's not one I think that's going to be solved across the entire country without constant vigilance here. Has there been a sense from, certainly within your members, that there are points where they have to withdraw staff because they feel that conditions are just not workable or has everybody somehow managed to carry on and make things work? Generally, people have been able to carry on and make things work. But certainly since the new variant of COVID emerged, a lot of our members are starting to feel more unsafe. We have actually put out guidance to members about what they can do to try to ensure that they and their staff are safe and also to outline the fact that they are entitled to refuse to work in circumstances where the rules are not being applied effectively so that that our members remember that they have legal obligations to their employees not to put them in an unsafe environment and they also just have to take care of their own safety as well, even where it's not about the legal responsibilities. It's simply about ensuring that they are able to carry on working, that they don't become sick themselves, infect their families uh, and all the uh, the knock-on effects that that can have. You're right. The, there is an obligation to ensure that, that your staff are working in very safe conditions and you don't put somebody into a difficult situation. But then, of course, you feel an obligation to your client to be there, because obviously if somebody is on remand, then they are looking to you to be able to help them one way or another. And also there's the obligation to the court as well. That probably can actually create quite a stress, I would have thought. It can do, yes. And the clients do vary a lot as well. So, for example, where the client is an established client and has been through the system before, very often they'll be perfectly content with dealing with the lawyer over a video link. They know the lawyer, they know the system, works okay. For some clients, though, who are vulnerable, perhaps haven't been through the system before, that personal face-to-face contact really is extremely important. And you're right, there is a, a very sharp tension between the need to keep themselves safe and the need to provide that service to the client that will give them the assurance they need, the support they need, at what is inevitably a very difficult and stressful time for the client. There's a real tension there, and a lot of our members juggling as to how best 
to balance those different pressures. Obviously, different lawyers will come to different conclusions on that, but a lot of them are putting the needs of the client first and saying, well, yes, there may be a risk there, but it's a risk that they feel they have to run, provide the professional service that the client needs. That creates a stress in itself and I think there's a real need for firms to be able to have a safe way to talk through those stresses and deal with them and don't try and carry them all on their own as well. There is, yes. And it's one of those things it's easy to overlook in all the efforts to keep the system running, keep the clients served, that actually the impact on the solicitors themselves is huge. And they're going through the same stresses as everyone is as a result of lockdown and the impact of the virus and also the pressures of serving their clients, keeping the justice system running. We have put out a number of resources on the Law Society website to try to help lawyers look after themselves, look after their staff. We have various pastoral care services that are available to members and we would strongly urge anyone who is feeling under stress to take a look at that and see if there's any of our services that can help them. We had a very brief conversation prior to starting the podcast and there was a couple of things that come out of that conversation. I suppose the most obvious one is court safety and vaccine prioritisation. We've already talked a little bit about court safety, but is there any hint that there may be some prioritisation on the basis that the justice system is an essential service and, and everybody working within it are key workers? We've had somewhat mixed messages on this. The committee which has been looking at how to prioritise vaccinations set out some initial priorities which were based on age and vulnerability, and that obviously had to be the first step. However, they did also say that when it comes to the second wave of vaccinations, the priority based on the status of being critical workers was something that would be worth looking at. It's already been acknowledged by the government that lawyers who are keeping the justice system running are critical workers. And so in our view, they should be prioritised for vaccination if they are involved in court hearings and being exposed to this risk. But that's something that's still under discussion. The Prime Minister recently did seem to dismiss that as a a possible way forward. But uh, we, we do think that at some point there will be talk about prioritisation based on profession, certainly be pressing for lawyers to be among the groups that are prioritised there. The immigration lawyers must be struggling with the same problems across hearings and detention centres as well. Is the work carrying on or hearings taking place at all? It is still functioning to a degree. Again, hearings are very often taking place remotely there. You do have, again, a lot of detained clients. So some of the same issues as you get with police station and prisons also arise when we're talking about immigration practice as well. So there are very similar challenges there, but the system is still operating. People are still managing to keep going. But again, a lot of the lawyers are taking risks in order to make sure that the system still keeps working effectively. Shifting the focus outwards slightly now from the front line, I think a couple of other topics that are really worth having a catch up with you on is is means testing and financial support. Do you want to just bring us a little bit more up to date on where things are with these? On means testing, a couple of years ago, we commissioned some reports looking at the impact of the means tests. Those reports showed that they were biting at a level that meant that people who were objectively in poverty were being asked to pay unaffordable contributions, or even in some cases being deemed too rich to qualify for legal aid. As a result of those reports, the government was persuaded to undertake a review of the means test, and that's ongoing at the moment. We're expecting a report in the spring, along with a consultation on changes which we hope will lead to some significant improvements there. Alongside that we've also been undertaking some strategic litigation and we had a couple of cases last year around the capital rules that were successful and these led to new regulations coming in just before Christmas. One of the bizarre rules was that the legal aid means test only took account of the first £100,000 of a mortgage against your property. So what this meant was if you had a £250,000 house and you had a £250,000 mortgage, the legal aid agency would treat you as having £150,000 capital. Now that was clearly ludicrous, clearly absolutely unsustainable and we were very pleased that following the test case that we brought last year, the government acknowledged this and actually brought in regulations ahead of the broader review to abolish that rule. So that's been some really good progress already as a result of the strategic litigation. Also, we are expecting a report within the next three or four months that hopefully will significantly improve the situation for both the civil and 
criminal means tests. The obvious question is to ask why every time something like this is brought in, there are so many errors in understanding what poverty is, what the breadline might look like. And as you say, that particular point with regards to capital, does the government accept that it's not particularly fit or is this a tough battle you're having to fight convincing them? anything to do with legal aid, it tends to be quite a tough battle. What we tend to find is there is always a very high bar set for the evidence we have to produce to be able to persuade the government to spend money on things. So that's inevitable. It's not a party political thing. It's the same with any government. So what we have to do is just get as strong evidence as we possibly can to persuade the government to make changes. One of the significant things with the means test is it's something that has built up over time because the means test used to be uprated in line with inflation every year, and that stopped in 2010. So the effect of that has been every year, the means test has uh, shrunk and shrunk in real terms, to the extent now that far more people in poverty are actually not meeting the means test. So I think the fact that we've had that 10-year period without any uprating helped us persuade the ministry that this was something that did need to be looked at. And those reports, I think, um, really did hit home with them to show why it was such a serious problem. Is it possible to say that X number of people have ended up being denied legal aid simply because the benchmark is getting lower and lower and lower? So people who maybe 10 years ago might have been allowed legal aid and therefore to see a solicitor and get their case heard are simply being denied that. Do we have stats on that? It's one of those things that's really difficult to test it out. If you go back to 2010, something like 30 to 32 percent of households would qualify for some help with legal aid. That, I think, has dropped to somewhere in the mid-20s. The difficulty in putting actual numbers on it is that um, because the scope of legal aid has also changed significantly, yep. you just can't compare the, the numbers effectively. You, you could have said at the, uh, the time in 2010, yes, you would expect X number of people to have a legal problem that would fall within the legal aid system because so much has changed. You just can't do a like for like comparison. Can we turn to the subject of financial support and where this sits at the moment as far as the Law Society, as far as you're concerned? I think there's two aspects to this. The first is the underlying problem of the economic unsustainability of legal aid work. And then there is the direct impact of the pandemic and what that's done to firms' cash flow, to workloads and to the financial health of firms as a result of that. Right from the outset, we lobbied government to provide support to legal aid firms to enable them to weather the storm during the uh, the pandemic. And what we found was that the legal aid agency was willing to look at the payments on account mechanisms that they had. And they made a number of changes to those which have helped to improve cash flow. But of course, one of the problems with that is in effect, what you're doing is you are getting up front the money that you were going to use to pay all your expenses in six months' time. That then begs the question, how do you survive at the point when you would have been relying on that money in the future? There are also concerns about what's going to happen to firms once tax bills become due, because we think there are a lot of debts, particularly around tax, that firms are just not equipped now to be able to deal with simply because income has fallen through the floor in many areas. So that's the situation during the pandemic. But of course, this is a much longer standing problem. We've been saying for many years that legal aid practice is unsustainable. In criminal law, for example, what you see is an ageing profession. We published a heat map a few years ago that showed there are now some counties in this country where there are no lawyers under 35 doing criminal defence work. Young lawyers might come into this for a short while, but they don't see a long-term career doing this work. And it's hardly surprising, given that the rates have not increased in cash terms since the mid-1990s, have been cut several times along the way. When the uh, the government uh, put forward some money in the, uh, the Criminal Legal Aid Review last year, that was the first time additional money had been provided to criminal litigators since the 1990s. The CPS was given increased funding to undertake recruitment, and where they recruited from was the defence side of the profession. They don't, on the whole, train up their own lawyers. They do to a degree, but the the vast majority of new CPS lawyers over the past couple of years have been coming from the defence profession. And we have heard of some firms that have actually had to close down their crime departments because they've lost key staff Mm. to the CPS. So eventually, in 2018, the government was persuaded to undertake this criminal legal aid review. That was then delayed by the pandemic. We did get the 
quotes accelerated items, which led to a number of payments for specific aspects of criminal practice, in particular to do with the use of the study of unused material and also for cases that are sent to the Crown Court. So a number of additional payments that have been of some help, but it's really a drop in the ocean compared with what's needed. What we have is, I liken it to a situation where someone's falling out of the eighth floor window and they're one floor off the ground saying, I'm still okay now. What a response we get from the government that the system hasn't collapsed yet, that there are still enough firms doing this work to cover the duty schemes, to cover the courts. And therefore, there's not an urgent need to put more money into the system. But the fact of the matter is, if you wait until the system actually has collapsed before you start to put things right, it's going to be vastly more expensive and vastly more difficult to put it right. And so we keep urging the government not just to undertake this fundamental review, which the, the independent part of it has finally got underway this year, but also that there needs to be interim relief. There needs to be an increase in rates across the board so that firms are able to survive while we're waiting for the outcome of this review. Is there a danger that the government will use the pandemic and the cost of supporting businesses generally as yet another reason to not weigh in and help specifically in this area? I think in terms of support during the pandemic, what we've been seeing is obviously the Treasury came up with a number of generic packages that were available to businesses generally. The Legal Aid Agency came up with a number of measures to help with cash flow. But overall, the, the government simply wasn't persuaded that any more assistance was needed. Now, you can agree or disagree with that assessment, but I do think that they were genuinely looking at it to try to see was more help needed. I don't think there was a deliberate neglect there, but simply that they set a high bar for evidence. They didn't feel that that bar had been met and therefore they, they made that calculated decision not to provide additional support. We do think that that was unfortunate fortunate that it was risky and undoubtedly it will have cost some firms their very existence. But from the government's point of view, the system is still functioning today. They have still got coverage today. And so they would say they've made the right judgment on that. We'll see over the next few months whether actually um, the, the system is rather weaker than they currently anticipate. I'm guessing one of the principal problems with cash flow is that cases aren't concluding effectively. If you can't have a hearing, then you've got a lot of work in progress hanging around awaiting a conclusion which might not happen for 6, 12, 18 months, the way things are going at the moment. Yes, it's two things. Um, one is that there has just been a reduction in the volume of cases coming through because of the pandemic. So that's had an impact. But a large part of it is down to the delays in the courts and the fact that cases aren't concluding. One of the things we've been lobbying the legal aid agency for is around their payment on accounts mechanism for Crown Court cases. At the moment, it's based on the fact that they will pay the cracked trial fee and no more than that on the basis that you know, that's the minimum that would be due and therefore that's not exposing the LAA to any risk. A lot of those cases would actually be due the full trial fee. So that means that even with the payment on account mechanisms that are currently in place, there is a lot of work in progress tied up that firms are unable to bill as a result. And so we're trying to persuade the legal aid agency that they need to address this issue. They need to pay a bit more on account. And even if in the individual case, there may be reconciliation has to be done further down the line across a body of cases, then the situation is still going to be very much in their favour. It's unlikely that they will ever find themselves out of pocket overall. There does need to be more relaxation to ensure that that firms can free up a bit more of this work in progress where you've got cases that perhaps won't be heard before 2022, even 2023 we're hearing now. So looking at legal aid post-COVID, we know there was a tender coming up for crime in the non-too-distant future, but that has been delayed by 12 months and contracts extended until September 2022. Does this help or hinder in the circumstances? I think for most firms, this will be helpful. It means that the next tender round will happen only after the worst of COVID is over, at least hopefully. One of the key questions, though, is how quickly will firms actually get the benefits of the results of the criminal legal aid review? It's obviously a matter of extreme urgency that firms get increased funding as quickly as possible. And having the contracts extended by a further six months on the face of it could mean, therefore, that there is a further delay before any benefits of Clark come through to firms. So we are very keen to ensure that the benefits are delivered as quickly as possible. 
Part of the government's thinking here, though, was it may be that that additional six month window will enable them to run a tender, including all of the changes arising out of CLA, to start in September 2022. And that, in fact, may therefore mean that the, the changes come through at the earliest opportunity as a result of this change. So it's very difficult at this stage. There are so many moving parts that it's difficult to be sure actually whether this is going to be the best outcome for firms or if it is going to mean more delay. One of the things that is of concern is the issue of any firms who wanted to get a contract for the first time at the next point of uh, contract retendering. These firms are few and far between, but there are some, for example, where the existing firm is giving up its contract and its criminal department may want to set up separately. These firms at the moment are left something in limbo. Originally, the contract terms said that the existing contract can be extended until spring 2022. So this further six month extension is something that wasn't expected and isn't actually catered for within the existing contract. So we need some clarity for those firms that might have been wanting to bid for a contract and whether they will now have to wait the additional six months or if there is a way to bring them into the system at the time that the current contracts were due to expire. Just as a tangent, audits, are they taking place at the moment? I'm assuming anyway, the LAA aren't sending anybody on site because there's nobody in the firms. That's right. Yes, they're not undertaking face-to-face audits on the whole now. They're starting to look at when and how they might reintroduce face-to-face audits. What they are trying to do, however, is improve dialogue with firms to understand what firms are doing in terms of supervision requirements, offices, etc., where they're taking advantage of the concessions that the LAA has made and just trying to get a clear picture and to do remote audits where they can, where that's practical. But yes, it's it's still a, a very patchy situation where the LAA is not able to do all of the auditing it normally would. Inevitably, they are going to move back to that probably sooner rather than later. I think one of the things they're feeling is because this has now been going on for so long, they can't just work on the basis of, oh, well, we'll wait till everything gets back to face to face. They need to make sure they've got some checks and balances in place to assure themselves that firms are complying with the contracts. But we are seeing right across the board now quite a fundamental shift. Some would argue a a long overdue shift for all law firms shifting to a digital structure. And whatever the, the pain points that the pandemic and everything else has brought with it, there does seem to now be a genuine acceptance that being a digital firm does have its advantages and that being forced down that rabbit hole has caused some firms to finally accept that there's, in terms of financials, if nothing else, there is some good to be had out of it. So is there going to be a point when the LAA also is going to have to accept that the firm as a physical construct simply may not survive intact as a result of this pandemic? Because, of course, one of the ways of keeping costs down is not having a physical office, isn't it? It is. And this is a discussion that we keep coming back to every time there's a new tender round. So last time round, we actually did have quite a debate about is there a need for a physical office or should we be starting to think about moving away from that? It does open up all sorts of cans of worms when you go down that route. One of the key issues here is having the physical office is what determines which duty schemes you can be on. You move away from the physical office, that then opens the question, well, how do you determine what schemes people can uh, join? It would be a whole new way of organising the entire structure. But I think you're right, the, the, the changes over the past year, inevitably many of them are not going to revert to the pre-pandemic status quo. And so one of the areas that we've got lined up for discussion with the legal aid agency is to talk about what changes do we need to the contract to acknowledge the fact that the world has changed. Much more is going to be done digitally, whether that's remote attendance on clients, whether that's remote court hearings, or if it's around the way that the firm itself operates and manages itself. All of these things, I think, have changed permanently. And we need to make sure that the legal aid system adapts to ensure that those changes are properly recognised, that payments keep pace with the new ways of working, the management rules also adapt and change as necessary to deal with the digital world. I think that's right, because in practice, those things have already changed within firms. After a a difficult start last March, we have seen firms adapt really very well, actually, possibly against their own better instincts at times when they, you know, they didn't think things would be possible. But they're really starting to learn how to adapt to remote supervision and also making sure that that everybody feels there is somewhere to go to, you know, because it's so easy in the office, wasn't it? You just turn around and whoever may be your supervising partner or your supervising solicitor, you can ask a question question of people have learned very well actually 
uh, to handle that because they've had to, of course, and because they're having to manage the risk within the firm right across the board. You know, they don't want anything nasty leaping out in terms of insurance claim or whatever. So the adaptation has already been made and the LAA may have to catch up to recognise that there are other forms that work just as well. I think that's right, yes, and that's going to be central to our discussions. It has been a very interesting experience over the past year. Coming into this year, a lot of us had various preconceptions about what would or would not work remotely. And I think some of those preconceptions have been overturned and we found actually things can work this way a lot better than we ever thought they might. Others have been, I think, vindicated. So some of the difficulties around cases involving cross-examination or remote uh, or or vulnerable clients, those really don't seem to work well remotely. We've also learnt new things, such as that holding an all-day hearing online is very much more tiring than holding that same hearing in a physical environment. Nobody predicted, but many people have reported that's been their experience in the past few months. So we've learnt a lot of new things about this way of working, as well as testing out some of the uh, presumptions that uh, we all had beforehand. We had possibly all of us underestimated how important that visual read of everybody involved in hearing was in terms of the way that the next stage of the case evolved in real time. But I think there's a lot of other advantages that have come through which could help cash-strapped firms if they're allowed to stay in place. Yeah, so one of the things we've seen is people are able to deal with clients remotely. One of the classic things, I think, is the administrative hearings in court on Mm. both the criminal and the civil side, that it's far more effective for the lawyer to be in their office and just dial into the hearing when it happens. And it means that they can deal with it in perhaps 15 minutes instead of the time to get to the court, the time sitting around waiting, the time traveling back again. So you can massively reduce the amount of either unpaid or very significantly lower paid time that you're spending Mm. on cases. There are some real benefits, real efficiencies to be had through doing that sort of thing. Those are some of the things we hope will be retained going forward. I think that's a really good place to end our conversation today. My thanks to you, Richard, for being here with us. And a reminder to everyone listening that if you have any queries regarding issues he has covered today, then the Law Society website has a lot of resources that you can use to help you. Alternatively, if you have questions about any aspect of being a digital law firm, then please email them to us at digitalsolicitor at leap.co.uk. Thank you for listening. Take care. And I look forward to being with you next time on the Digital Solicitor podcast. Thank you.